Welcome back, horror fans, cinephiles, and giallo enthusiasts. This is Tanner Leeser, your host for all things giallo here on The King in Giallo. Our next stop on our journey through giallo cinema is the only giallo film directed by auteur director Giulio Questi in 1968. In this video, I will do a deep dive overview, then segue into a full review and gialli tally. The overview will be spoiler free, the review and gialli tally will not. Here is Death Laid an Egg Overview Death Laid an Egg, released in 1968, is an Italian and French co-production. It is directed by Giulio Questi, who also wrote the film alongside Franco Arcali. Franco Arcali edited the film, and the music is by Bruno Maderna. The film stars Gina Lollobrigida as Anna, Jean-Louis Trintignant as Marco, Eva Allen as Gabriella or Gabri, Jean Sobieski as Modaini, and Renato Romano as Luigi. The plot follows Marco, who is married to Anna but is visibly infatuated with his wife's cousin Gabriella. Unbeknownst to them, however, is that Marco is something of a sexual deviant who gets his rocks off by meeting sex workers and unleashing his morbid and violent S&M fantasies upon them. He plans to do away with his wife and run away from his busy life with Gabri, but Anna is the one who runs the show. The successful chicken farm they manage is owned by Anna, and she won't just roll over. The advertisement group tied to the success of the chicken farm pushes a new campaign to proclaim that chickens are a deep part of everyday life for all the people of the world. Not to mention, they are also running Frankenstein experiments to create biological anomalies that will yield more meat per individual chicken. In the midst of all this, a mysterious figure named Modaini slinks into the picture and seems to be conspiring with Gabri. Marco's perversions become more sinister as he gets closer to finally dispose of his wife once and for all and running away with Gabri. In the limited running for auteur directors trying their hands at the growing giallo market, we have Michelangelo Antonioni's Blow Up 1966, which manages to fall outside the bounds of what a giallo is. Then we have Deadly Sweet 1967 by Tinto Brass, and starring both Jean-Louis Trintignant and Eva Allen from this same film. And in 1968, we have Death Laid an Egg by Giulio Questi, who delivers one hell of a bizarre giallo film, which just manages to hold on to another of the conventions to still be called one. The B-plot of the movie is a satire of the advertising industry, which sees the main characters agreeing to a ploy to sell the idea that chickens are an indispensable part of their everyday lives, and they will take this strategy as far as even rebranding the image of poultry as being a part of the everyday going on of the very fabric of society, and thus explode their sales through the roof. This satirical B-plot is balanced by the melodramatic A-plot, which dedicates much of its time to a love triangle forming in the mind of Marco, our main protagonist, at the same time as his mind seems to be separating from reality as his fever dreams of sexual violence begin to take over. From the opening kill with its blaring and jarring soundtrack, with the masterful editing by co-writer and editor Franco Arcali, this film establishes right out of the gate that it is as different and special as it is weird. Questi's utilization of mise-en-scene showcases that a giallo doesn't always have to be as violent or gore-filled or sleazy as later entries into the genre in order to establish a more lasting impact with its audience. The film looks terrific, and the directing and editing work superbly together to work as effectively, if not more, than the more standard jelly, which rely on the cliché sequences of stalk and slash. Despite not having any such scenes, the film dedicates itself to following Marco as his mental state deteriorates, which is more effective in the long run, as it is both unsettling and disturbing to watch it all unfold. Jean-Louis Trintignant and Eva Allen join forces together again, hot off the limited success of Deadly Sweet, and they prove once again that they do indeed work very well off of each other as scene partners. Trintignant makes his character of Marco fascinating by conveying the tension of his inner life with not much spoken dialogue or gesturing. I talk more about Trintignant in episode 6 of the Forgotten Giallo series where I cover Deadly Sweet, 
But I want to mention here that what I didn't mention last time is that later this same year in 1968, he would star in what is one of the greatest spaghetti westerns of all time, directed by Sergio Corbucci, The Great Silence. <laughs> che fa tremare i cacciatori di taglie quando lo incontra. Lo chiamano silenzio, perché dopo che è passato lui, resta soltanto il silenzio. You know, the western in the snow that Tarantino is clearly obsessed with replicating the visuals of, and can you blame him? I digress. Joining the duo is Gina Lollobrigida, who is an equal match for them in the acting department. Lolo Brigida was born in 1927 and started out as a model, entering Miss Italy in 1947, but she lost to Lucia Bosse, a future actress. Lolo Brigida debuted in film earlier in 1946, and she was featured in some films which Mario Bava photographed, including Miss Italia, 1950, ironically enough. She also acted opposite Humphrey Bogart and Peter Lorre in Beat the Devil, 1953, directed by John Huston. After this, she inherited the title of The Mona Lisa of the 20th Century and The Most Beautiful Woman in the World. She was a major star through the 1950s and 60s and slowed down in the 1970s as she transitioned to being a photographer. She still did some TV appearances and a few film roles after this, mainly the comedy XXL, 1997. Director Giulio Questi, born in 1924, worked first in documentaries, then screenwriter and assistant director. He rose to notoriety following the release of his spaghetti western, Django Kill, 1967, a surrealist foray into the genre, the success of which allowed him to make Death Laid an Egg. Questi's approach to genre films, which was bombastic and unconventionally defiant, earned him a strong cult following. However, after Arcana, 1972, his horror thriller, he became relegated to working in Italian television as his cinematic endeavors became too risky for producers. Despite his following and praise from limited quarters of the artistic circles, his films were not conventional enough to warrant consistent commercial success. As it is, Death Laid an Egg is the only giallo film he ever made, but it remains one of the most evocatively surreal of the genre, with some even saying, if Jean-Luc Godard made a giallo, it would be like this. The film is a must-see for fans of the surreal, and giallo diehards will certainly be treated to a unique giallo viewing experience. But I digress. On to the review. Spoilers ahead for those of you who haven't yet seen the film. You've been warned. Let me say also that I do own this movie on Blu-ray, but for a reason I'm still trying to resolve, I was unable to rip the movie onto my computer for the video clips. I was able to find the movie streaming for free on Daily Motion at 1080p, so I'm using the footage from my screen recording of that. This version of the film is the extended director's cut, and whereas I would review this in the original Italian dub with the English subtitles, the video online was English dubbed only, and the extended scenes which are in Italian were not translated in the dub. I watched this movie on my TV with the Blu-ray while I simultaneously recorded it on my computer from the free stream, and I'm just going to exclude those extended scenes in my review because I'm not going to go back to my Blu-ray to get the translations. I apologize for that, but trust me, you aren't missing much. Okay, I'm gonna predict that the film will do modestly for the cliches, but I will say I don't think it's going to make the top three for now. I'll guess between 350 to 400 points. Beginning as always with the pre-viewing cliches, the repeat offenders are one point for actor, three for writer, three for composer, and five for director. Ava Allen and Jean-Louis Trintignant were both in Deadly Sweet, two points. And Julio Questi co-wrote The Possessed, three points. Cliché points for the title, we have Death and A Declaration, five points each, ten points total. First look. We have 25 points for the Italian director, and an additional 15 points for the influence bonus of this being a proto giallo. And would you look at that, it is plot o'clock. The movie begins with an opening title sequence, and what a sequence it is. 
It looks like the biological version of Oppenheimer's opening if that one was the nuclear version. Weird comparison, I know, but trust me, the movie will be way weirder. E is for eyeballs, five points. Spiral staircase, five points. Urban locales, two points. We are privy to different people going about their days in a hotel, and I love how Questiche shows us this guy planning to end it all. I don't know why, it's just morbidly hilarious to me that he felt it necessary to include. Our protagonist is in a room with an escort. We see him pull a blade out. K is for knife, five points. One of the men is eavesdropping. We get another knife. Z is for zoom, five points. The eavesdropper goes to the balcony and becomes a voyeur. V is for voyeur, extra for it being an act of infidelity, 10 points total. G is for gloves, extra points for them being black, 10 points. The man becomes a witness to the unfolding violence inside. The scene shows Marco slashing the woman, but interestingly, the blade doesn't get bloodied. I'm going to hold off on tallying the obvious cliches here like the kill and W is for witness, but I will get back to this all in due time. Necking, five points. Extra points for K is for knife for the bloodied knife. Add another five points. The scene cuts. The witness exits an elevator and beelines for a telephone. T is for telephone, five points. He watches as Marco also exits the elevator. Marco gets in his car and drives. He seems to be visually bombarded with advertisements along his drive. He arrives at his office. His secretary tells him invoices for his new machines are in. He seems lost in his thoughts and doesn't remember dealing with these, but they are in his name. She says they will be installed at his home and that his wife has been calling for him. Back at his wife's chicken farm, Marco and Anna, his wife, are frolicking among the chickens while being photographed by Gabri. She's the young cousin of Anna. He takes photos of them posing with and among the chickens. Now Anna photographs them. Hey, a dog, look at that. Animals featured, two points. As they continue their promotional photos, a falling tool crashes beside Anna. How did that happen? I mean, it couldn't have just fallen down. How did that happen? It couldn't have just fallen down. Hey, stop it. Anna blames the workmen and refuses to believe Marco that it was purely an accident. She believes it was intentional. The workers no longer are employed there, presumably because they've been replaced by machines. The whole bunch of them are standing outside ominously watching the three characters. The next scene they are looking through the photos. Anna takes issue with how her hair turned out. As Marco shows them photos he was given of the new machinery, we hear a harsh music stinger and catch the briefest of glimpses of a photo with Marco, which he hides right away before excusing himself to make a call. In private, Marco tears up the photo which shows him looking surprised at the camera. We get a close-up of a door handle, five points. His wife tells him that some man she doesn't know was at the house earlier inquiring about him. Anna describes the man who came by. Her description seems like the man who was eavesdropping earlier on. A car parks outside in the night and an unknown person gets out. As the two are getting undressed, Anna talks about Gabriela and makes some odd comments about how she looks, admiring her nude form. They get into bed, then Anna says she had a dream about Gabri lying motionless. The man outside is the very same man from the beginning. Marco awakens to the car starting up. Faulty car, two points. He goes to Gabriela's room, but she's not there. He throws on a coat and goes to the chicken farm. He hears Gabri talking to someone. As Marco enters a lab room attached to the farm, the lights go out, and in a moment of fear, he knocks over some lab equipment. Not sure what that is, but I'll reckon I don't want to know. At the risk of sounding scientifically inept, he puts some tubes in the things and leaves. The car's headlights drift away. The next morning, we are shocked to discover he and his wife sleep in separate beds. Oh, and she's already gone. Gabri is likewise not there. The women are outside. Gabri says she couldn't sleep last night, but woke up to get her medicine. L is for lies, five points. Marco knows he's seen bags of manure not nearly as full of shit. They are inviting people for a party Friday. Marco reminds them to invite the association, and apparently, Gabri suggests they make it a masquerade. Marco excuses himself to meet with the association. He re-enters the lab and finds broken glass on the floor. Uh, yeah, that was you. He finds a piece of cloth with symbols on it and pockets it. The lab technician, or whatever he is, walks in. The man turns on the new machine as they briefly discuss how the labor is without the workers. 
Easy enough, apparently. The music blasts through the PA system. I have no comment for this. Ah, now it's working. Cut to Gabrice swimming with Anna poolside. Gabrice says she's invited someone. Gee, I wonder who. She admits it is the same man looking for Marco the day before. I love how Ava Allen is directed to just walk towards the camera and then turn and show her ass. It's like a preview to how gratuitously sexual these types of films will shamelessly become. Marco enters into the association. Big as fuck egg. Death laid it. Can I just call this guy the doctor? The doctor tells Anna that someone has been in his lab and interfered with his experiments. He warns that the radioactive cultures he is working with are delicate and a botch could ruin the entire experiment. Exposition dumping, two points. The association tells Marco that they want him to head the publicity for their project by approving slogans and drawings. They buzz in a man who specializes in publicity work. Mondaini, who introduces himself as the one looking for Marco yesterday. Cut to Marco and his associates watching a video about the embryonic development of chickens. There are a lot of scenes which are not subtitled, and this scene contains the longest of them. As I said, I won't be covering them in this video, but just know the deleted scenes are mostly surrounded around the B-plot and what the association is doing in the lab and in their advertisements. Next scene, as Marco is out meeting with Gabri, he notices the scarf is identical to the cloth he found in the lab this morning. When questioned, she says Anna gave it to her and that she doesn't understand the symbols, and he admits he doesn't either. Uh, hell. Cues for questions. Five points. This movie is indulgent when it comes to Ava Allen, and I am for it. In the car, he continues questioning her. She says why she got out of bed last night, sticking to her story, and she says she's afraid of Anna. Now, because of Marco's remark and this first person shot, I'm going to say reckless driving, five points. She mentions her fear stems from losing her mother and when she begins to delve into things, Marco tells her to stop. Cut to these insane flashback shots of the aftermath of a car accident with extra points for Zia's for Zoom for a zoom on a dead victim another five points. Cut again to Marco and Gabri kissing. The script seems to imply this has been an ongoing thing, as it was hinted in the previous scenes that Gabri has warned Marco not to look for her at night. He makes a comment that her eyes betray that she is in love, while she says he hides behind his eyes, then asks why they must always meet up like this. He asks if she will run away with him, but she says no. When he presses her on why, she responds doubting that their hooking up will last. I will say that the movie makes it clear that Marco is kinda obsessed with Gabri, so O is for obsession, five points. He confesses that he wants to start over with her, and that in his current life he is stuck making decisions that he has no interest in. They flirt back and forth, then Gabriella asks what he'll do, since Anna owns the poultry farm and the bank account. She asks why he married Anna, to which he says he was in love with her, and when she asks him about it, we get a second flashback showing Anna and Marco. The flashbacks are interspersed with the scene of Marco and Gabri. When Marco says they will run away, she says no, she will stay here. Cut to Gabri dropping Marco off, and boy does he look pissy. He passes by a shop selling apparel with many of the articles bearing the same design of symbols as the scarf. Marco locks eyes with a woman in the shop, then follows her out. Marco is stopped by Mondaini, who asks him to look over his designs. Back at the office, he shows Marco his designs. I'll let Mondaini explain them. Now we want to try to conceptualize the chicken as the principal actor in the drama of modern life. Here you see the chicken as an engineer. Here is a doctor. Here is the politician. Here is the businessman. And here as the soldier. Why not? Men and chickens mixed up like that. We'll take them by surprise with an approach that's absolutely new, that's newer than tomorrow preposterously new. My other idea is the chicken is the average man, whether on the street or at home, more domesticated, and more like the average homemaker. Here are a few examples. This poster presents a mother-like chicken who protects husband and children. Here we have the family taking a walk, again with the chicken as an integral part. Playboy poultry and smoking jackets at a poultry party. Art. Yes, it is central to the plot, so extra points. 10 points. During this ludicrous explanation, Marco notices a bracelet on Mondaini's wrist, which steals his attention. Cut to the party. Mondaini inquires about a door that locks because he wants to introduce a game to the group which requires such. They find such a room, and on Mondaini's instruction, they remove everything from the room. Supposedly, the game is called Locked Up with a Partner, and it is a truth-telling game. The first couple goes in, we have a deleted scene, and when the movie resumes, they come out. 
seemingly having hooked up. After Mondaini ushers in the next couple, he says to Gabri for them to sneak off and also for her to stop drinking so much. The next couple exits the room with the woman red in the face and in tears as the man watches as she goes. The third couple has an overly frisky man trying to get the woman to hook up with him and she is not about it one bit. Gabri expresses doubts to Mondaini, but he says that they can do it and for her to not lose her nerve. What in the hell are they up to? Marco suspiciously has his eyes on them. Cut to a fourth couple awkwardly hooking up inside the room. Are these what office parties are like? Cut to a fifth couple hooking up inside. I don't think this is a truth telling game at all. Marco goes into the room and is alone now with Gabri. He questions her on knowing Mondaini, but she plays dumb. She says she's known him since yesterday. He then confides that he's ready to run away with her and that she should forget all about Anna. They kiss. Mondaini turns the lights out. Gabri screams. Marco rushes out of the room, chastises whoever did that, then storms off. Gabri exits the room and apologizes for screaming. Anna holds her. The guests suggest it is getting late and they should leave. Anna agrees and then they all just leave. I have never seen a party shut down that disbanded this quickly and efficiently. Bravo. Anna and Gabri sit in the empty house. Anna finds a letter addressed to her. Whatever its contents are, they offend her, and she crumples it up and discards it on the ground, stating that they didn't even sign it, whoever it was. Marco returns to the hotel, as we see an escort being sent up to his room. Marco throws some money on the nightstand and freshens up. The escort walks in. F is for fashion. Five points. Gabri goes up to Anna, and they seem to be discussing the contents of the letter, which we don't know for certain what it said, but since Anna is voicing disappointment with Marco, it's likely that it mentioned his infidelity. Speaking of which, I is for infidelity. Five points. And again, I will hold off on giving extra points here. I promise to explain later. Marco ties the woman's hands behind her back with a cord. He digs through a bag and pulls out some fabric, which he uses to gag her. Using some red lipstick, he draws slashes on her. He pulls something else out and slashes her throat as we see blood drip down her neck. Marco goes to the mirror and looks at his reflection as he wipes blood all over the mirror. Back with Anna and Gabri, it is clear that Anna knows about his rendezvous with sex workers. I should have done this earlier, I suppose. S is for secrets. Five points. Gabri tells Anna where Marco picks up women and that he has a special room at a hotel and that he tips the desk clerk to help him. Anna says that she will fight to keep Marco. Her plan is to dress up as whores, in her words, and learn what she can from the other women. Marco comes home and seems to be slowly slipping down a dark path. He peers through the lock into Gabri's room and sees her and his wife sleeping cut to the angry workers outside chucking rocks into Marco's bedroom window and smashing one of the panes of glass. Gabri walks by the window naked and you know what? We don't quite see it all. We don't really even see nipple, but I'm going to be generous and award the first N is for nudity. Five points. Marco is walking among the chickens as his dog terrorizes them. Anna turns on the machine, which seems to be an entirely automated butchering and mulching mechanism that grounds whole chickens and then spurts the pieces out. The two talk about the situation with the angry workers. Marco finds his dog walking precariously atop the machinery, then slips and falls into it. It is implied that the little fella has been pulverized by the large rollers. He looks for the dog, but he's Garmin Bosia now. Marco walks into an adjoining room where a bunch of female workers are preparing chickens for slaughter and defeathering the dead ones. We see chickens killed with some instrument. I'll spare you the images of which because I'm certain this is all real. For animals, let's add three points to that two from earlier for the animals seen being killed. Make that five total now. Anna and Gabri are out in public observing the prostitutes and how they behave. U is for undercover, five points. J is for J and B, five points. As the two discuss their observations, Mondaini spies on them. Marco returns to the association. He reserves a plane ticket for his wife. After some deleted scenes, we see Mondaini talking with Marco. Marco asks about seeing him with Gabri, but he says he was just giving her a lift. Mondaini says they still have work to do and asks if they can get together later to go over things. But Marco denies him and says that he will be too busy. We then see Marco burning the very ticket he picked up for Anna. He receives a frantic call from Anna who tells him to rush home and something incredible has happened. Prepare for things to get very weird. Back in the lab, Anna shows Marco the new specimens in the chicken farm are wingless and headless plumps of meat and they are most definitely alive. 
She tells him that the doctor said someone was in the lab, but he denies that it was him. The doctor walks in and is equally astounded. Anna says they've grown twice the size in an hour. The doctor marvels at this without them eating. He says this is the breakthrough of mutations he was seeking. This will revolutionize their industry. The doctor wants to tell the president of the association, but Marco says they're monsters and he wants them destroyed. Marco kicks out the doctor, who threatens to report him to the association and that Marco will lose his position. The two argue briefly and then Anna storms out. Marco destroys the specimens. Cut to Gabri showing Anna a colored wig she picked up for her. Cut then to Marco either tampering with or repairing the machinery. I'll explain what's happening later. Cut back to Anna and Gabri. Anna says that now that he's destroyed her chickens, she wants to expose him and his secrets to the world. Cut back once more to Marco finishing up whatever he was doing. We briefly see Mondaini talking with the desk clerk at the hotel, who then gets on the phone. We then see Anna talking on the phone, and she is seemingly setting up a sting to catch Marco. Marco is now being chewed out by the association. They cannot understand why he did what he did, but he asserts that they made him sick. The chickens, that is. They cannot wrap their heads around that. In my opinion, those things were begging for death. Kill me! The desk clerk receives a call, seemingly from Marco. In private, Marco plays a tape recording of one of his earlier forays. Audio recording device, five points. We hear his inner monologue saying that this is what he wants, and at five o'clock, and that the machine is impossible to clean. All of this on a loop. My assumption is that he wants to toss Anna in the machine like how the dog fell in, but I don't entirely know. His secretary buzzes him and reminds him he needs to take his wife to the airport. Something tells me she won't be taking that flight. Marco walks menacingly about the chicken farm. Gabri is there too. She sees him and screams as we cut to Marco turning on the machine. Marco rushes out of the farm. Gabri runs through the aisles of chickens, trying to get away. Marco arrives at the hotel. Mondaini is here too, and he has two fresh scars on his face. Marco enters his room, checks himself in the mirror, then turns and sees Anna lying on the floor with her neck slashed. As he checks on her, we receive this wonderful bit of editing between this scene and the machine roller. Marco has a flashback to the feet he saw when he was last in the farm. He covers her body. Another flashback to Marco cutting the throat of the last girl. As he is soaking up pools of blood from the carpet, another flashback to the woman killed at the opening of the film. We then receive one more flashback in the most telling of all, the last woman he killed after he had cut her throat, taking her gag off. The police arrive outside the hotel, approach the desk clerk, and inquire about a phone call saying that a woman had been killed in room 724. We see a few of the dead sex workers, now alive, talking to the police and joking about how they've all, at one time or another, been killed in room 724. They say they were killed by a nice man and that he's likely up there now. The women laugh as the police rush upstairs to catch Marco who is carrying Anna's body down a service elevator. Evidence is seen being hidden, five points. The police enter the room, but it is empty and things are in order. They say they must question him over public morality, and the clerk says that he has been renting the room for several months. As Marco drives off with Anna, supposedly in the back seat, he turns back to check on her body and hears her voice in a sort of audible flashback. The next sequence is rather strange. He is stopped as truckloads of chickens are thrown out from the cages into the streets to the delight of the public who flock to grab as many as they can. Gabri is talking with Mondaini and she's telling him about seeing Marco. He says that Marco must have thought Gabri screaming was actually Anna because Marco's plan was to push her into the machine and that he had already loosened the railing. That's what he was doing. He also knows that the ticket to Amsterdam was meant to be his alibi and that his trip to the hotel was also part of his alibi. A is for alibi, five points. Mondaini says that Marco, despite planning everything, fell into their trap. The police must have him by now. Gabri says that then they will soon inherit everything and she won't have to be the poor cousin anymore. Mondaini says that she will run the house as he continues the biological experiments. He says he killed Anna, but that she managed to scratch him, to which Gabri asks if Anna screamed, which he affirms. They kiss, but are interrupted by someone pulling up. Marco walks in holding Anna's body. He's still planning on tossing her into the machine, apparently. In her hand, she is clutching Mondaini's bracelet. Odd clue, five points. Another flashback of Marco remembering seeing the bracelet. We see clips of Mondaini taking out a knife before he killed Anna. We see yet another flashback of Gabri from the party. We see the egg that smashed on the floor earlier. 
I'm not gonna say this is a flashback, at least it is not in the same way. All the other flashbacks before this have been memories, and this seems more symbolic to the audience to state that Marco has finally cracked. Marco falls back from the railing and into the machine. Someone dies by falling to their death. 15 points. Mondaini and Gabri enter the farm, but cannot find anybody inside. They look around. Gabriella screams. She's found Anna's body. She says that Marco must also be here. He says to Gabri to help him with Anna, but she says she's afraid, to which he says, stupid. Typical 1970s Italian misogyny, woman is called stupid. Three points. The police conveniently enter and find the two of them standing over Anna's body. Gabri asserts that they didn't do it, that it was Marco. She says he must have escaped, and the police now look around the factory. They take the two in for questioning. Why is for yelling? Five points. What do you want us for? We haven't done anything. We're innocent. We're innocent! The final shots show the chickens eating from their feed, which is presumably composed of Marco now. The film ends with the police looking for photos of Marco and requesting a warrant. The final shot shows a cop sucking the yolk out of an egg. Fine. Yeah, no, yeah, it, no, it is, yeah. Certainly weird as fuck. And that's Death Laid an Egg. So, I like this movie. It's certainly an underrated one which doesn't seem to have as big of a viewership as it deserves. Being a proto-giallo, unbeholden to the tropes of the soon-to-be genre, this film, much like others, very much does its own thing. I'll explain that more when I'm discussing the cliches tallied and the ones overlooked, but wow, this is a different one. The strangest aspects to me are the biological experiments, the entire plot sequences dealing with the advertisements of the chickens, which the deleted scenes are mostly those scenes, and then the kills actually being a sadist fantasy role-playing game, that was a trip. Let me say, remember the part with Mondaini explaining how chickens need to be branded as, like, people, an integral part of our everyday life? That notion is said repeatedly and in different ways in those deleted scenes. I know because I remember them constantly reminding Marco that that is their mission. Renato Romano plays Luigi, who is entirely in these deleted scenes, so you don't get to see any of him in this film review. Anyways, yes, I like this movie. I like the main cast, particularly Ava Olin and Jean-Louis Trintignant. The music is absurd as hell, and the editing is spectacular. Now, some have said this is the giallo if Jean-Luc Godard would have made one, and at first I didn't fully see it, but now I do, and I actually had to re-record this. This is Piero Le Fou as a thriller. From the main plot of the husband and worker escaping his stable yet boring life for the passionate desire towards the younger woman, to the colors and editing, to the satirical take on capitalism, whereas Piero Le Fou is more geared towards consumerism, Death Laid an Egg is more focused on advertisements. I mean, it's not a perfect comparison, but I see the similarities. But I'm not a huge Godard nerd, so I'd have to ask some other cinephiles what they think. Wink wink. Comments below, would love to hear what you think if you are such a cinephile. Okay, the cliche points I did not credit. This is very brief. I did not give extra points for V is for Voyeur for the Voyeur becoming a witness. Likewise, I did not give W is for witness because it is not a murder being witnessed. I could have given these points and a part of me wanted to, but I decided to stick to my guns and only count those cliches for being genuine. Thank you for understanding. Sure. Let's segue to the Gialli Tally cliches for this movie. Post Giallo viewing cliches. The reason for the killings. In the case of the only actual murder committed, it is greed and gain, five points. The reason for the investigation. Um, hmm. There's not really a true investigation in this one. Anna and Gabri are investigating Marco, whom they believe to be committing murders. I'm not going to give any of the formal categories to this movie, but I will award the five points for amateur sleuths. Five points. Bonus points. The style bonus. The movie gives us a fair amount of crash zooms, out of focus shots, though those are mostly seen in the deleted sequences. There aren't any of the gorgeous colored lights we associate with many of these films, and there is a bit of a lack of the stark use of light and darkness we tend to see a lot of in the black and white yellow films. We do get some impressive shots through the microscope, as well as the opening sequence being laden in these same types of shots, and these are certainly unique for this film in the genre. We lack dissolves, POVs, and slow-mos, but get one or two odd film effects here and there, which many other Gialli are more than happy to just bombard us with. All in all, the film is stylistic, but in a different way. 
The colors are there, and in terms of visual style, I'd say the editing and framing of individual shots carries the true bulk of the style along. The soundtrack is working overtime, but I'll get to that in a few seconds. So overall, I'd say the film receives about 18 points out of 25 for its style bonus. Soundtrack. As odd as the music is, I'd say this is absolutely a giallo soundtrack. 15 points. Bad effects. Um, no. No. The only thing would be the scratches on Mondaini and the slash on Anna, but I'll say these effects are decent. No points. Final look. Extra points. The Deadpool, tallying how many kills and deaths are featured in the film. I break it down as thus, 10 points per kill or death scene for the main Deadpool, plus any stylistic kill multipliers, which we didn't add yet, plus the knife kill bonuses. Considering the kills involving Marco are fantasies and not genuine, the real Deadpool includes the dead body seen in this flashback of a car crash, 10 points. Anna, whose neck is slashed by a knife. That is, 10 points for the kill, 7 for the stylistic kill of a neck being slashed, and 5 points for the knife kill, making it a total of 22 points. And then Marco, who falls into a machine which grinds him into chicken feed. 10 points. Extended Deadpool for those other deaths mentioned but not seen. I give 3 points for each. I'm going to guess Anna's mother is the woman we see walking away from the car crash here, which she does mention her family died and it was a car crash, so I can only assume this is that. 3 points. Red herrings for the total number of legitimate suspects in the film. 5 points per legit suspect are awarded. Marco is certainly a red herring. 5 points. Mondaini. 5 points. And... Gabri, five points. I count Gabri and Mondaini because we become suspicious of them and what they are up to. I don't count Anna because despite making some odd comments about Gabri and her body, she isn't built up to be a person of suspicion. Flashback sequences. My god, I count eight flashbacks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Five points each is 40 points total. Nudity. I award five points for ass, seven for breasts, and 10 for genitalia. Now, I count Gabri as being nude here, but we don't fully see her breasts. So for nudity, I'll just give five points for the hell of it. Ladies and gentlemen, for Death Laid an Egg, I awarded the film an A to Z score of 17 out of 26. With the bonus points for these, we have a modified score total of 105 points. And for the full Gialli Tally score, I award Death Laid an Egg a Gialli Tally score of 372 points, compared to The Girl Who Knew Too Much with 452, Blood and Black Lace in second with 422, Libido in third with 407, Death Laid an Egg is in fourth, ahead of The Possessed in fifth with 328, and The Telephone in last with 254. I predicted between 350 and 400 points for this film, so I'd say I was pretty spot on. But like I've stated before, these points don't mean a movie is better or worse. Hey y'all, don't forget the audience submissions. For these film reviews, I will be accepting memes you the viewer submit to me created from still shots or GIFs from the movie with some accompanying text. The best ones I will feature in the follow-up videos whilst giving you a shout out for your submission. I will also separately be accepting the best still shots from the film, inspired by the idea of every frame being a painting. This portion will be called Jello Shots. Submit any of your memes or best film frames for Death Laid an Egg to me at IcarusCrispy at gmail.com. Please leave a comment in any of my videos letting me know you've sent a submission so I can go into my email and check because otherwise I don't really check my email. Please like this video, share it with your friends if they are horror fans or cinephiles, subscribe to The King in Giallo if you haven't yet, and if you have any questions, thoughts, curiosities, or concerns, leave those below in the comment section and I will get back to you. Give The King in Giallo a follow on Instagram and a like on Facebook.
Next time on The King in Yellow will be the Friday the 13th special episode, then episode 8 of the Forgotten Yellow film series, 1968 Part 2. I will also be doing several special videos for October and for Halloween, and then return to the regularly scheduled content I have planned out for the rest of the year. By November, I will return with an overview, review, and jelly tally for the 1969 Porto Giallo Orgasmo, co-written and directed by Umberto Lenzi. Thank you very much for your continued support. This is Tanner Leeser for The King in Giallo, and if nothing else, I'll see you next time. Oh, yeah! 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 Yeah!